to you, Father God. We lift the word up to you, Father God. And Lord, we just bind the enemy that will try to move in any way in anyone's life this day. Lord, we thank you for your healing and for your miracles. We thank you, Father God, for everything that you're going to do this day, Father God. We thank you for lost souls. We thank you for those that are come, Father God, seeking answers, Father God. And Father God, we just thank you for your word, God. Your word will give those answers, Father God. We thank you for the anointing down on the pastor. We thank you, Father God, for the word that's going to go forth. Lord, we just give you praise, glory, and honor for all that you're going to do. And Father God, we just come to you this day. We come, Father God, praising and worshiping your holy name, Lord God. We come, Father God, lifting up your holy name. For your name is worthy to be praised, Father God. Lord, we just thank you for your blessings, Father God. We thank you for your covering down upon us, Father God. Lord, we thank you, Father God, that you are a good God. You are a merciful God, Father God. And Lord, we just come again this day. And once again, Lord God, we will lift up your holy name. And Lord, we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor for all that you're going to do in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, good morning. Say hello to somebody. I know most of us have already been talking and fellowshipping and going back and forth a little bit, which is good. How many of you remember what the meaning of church is? Ecclesia in the Greek, if you remember, and there was church long before the upper room. I know I say that every so often because people say that the church was born in the upper room, but in actuality, uh, there was what's called in the book of Acts, a church in the wilderness, because what the word church meant when Jesus said upon this rock in Matthew, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He was talking about the gathering together of the saints, the assembly of the saints, the congregation as it was in the days of old, even from the time of Moses all the way through to where we are today. So in reality, the book of Acts and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is an empowering of all those who are called out of the world to serve the Lord. Amen. Just in case you forgot that. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, everybody out there listening. I'm glad to see some folks already online with us. Um, we're going to do something a little bit different today, I think, but I want to talk about of God or of man. And listen, in everything we're doing today, as the people of God, if we're following the Lord, we have to be able to discern or to reason out through the scriptures whether what's going on is of God or man. I'm going to show you a picture a little bit later. How many of you remember the term Baphomet? And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it means, but I'm going to ask you to take a close look at it and tell me what you see uh, because there are some symbolic things there that might tell us some things that we need to pay attention to. So before we go there, I want to start this morning in something we talked about on Wednesday night a little bit, and it's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11, 12, and 13, if you remember that from Wednesday night. And I'm going to have to get something to prop my work up here a little bit. But in 1 Thessalonians 2, 11, it says, As you know, we exhorted you, or we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children. So I just want to keep reminding you and anybody listening in out there, the church, the pastor, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the teacher, uh, the fivefold ministry is here to continually exhort us comfort us and charge us because we are called to do some things and sometimes somebody has to lead the charge 
although we need comforted and we need build up. That word exhort doesn't mean flowery, puffy things and telling you how wonderful you are. It means telling you you've got to get strong in the Lord. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, which we're going to go to a little bit this morning. As you know, this is uh, Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. And what was your father supposed to help you do as you were growing up? He was supposed to teach you to stand up for things. He was supposed to comfort you when you fell down. And he's supposed to charge you and, and you know, put things there so as you go into life, you know what to do. You know what you're going to encounter and what you're going to see. Verse 12 says that you would walk worthy of God. And I know I say so many times today, it sounds like you don't have to do anything. God's so happy to have us. He's so blessed that we would go to church or that we would, you know, be called his people. But no, we're to walk worthy of all of that. As I probably said the last time we read through this, that like the ambassador of a country is to walk worthy of representing that country. You don't want an ambassador that you send into another country and he's a drunkard and a pedophile and a bunch of other things and living life any way he feels like it and forgets that he's representing your whole of the people. Mm -hmm. You want a good representative, right? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So that we would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. And of course, that all relates to some of the parables about the wedding feast and uh, the king preparing a dinner and inviting all those out there and many refused to come. And even now, as we know, uh, in that he refers to everybody out here in the world, he's calling to come to salvation. He's calling them to come to the saving grace and to be a part of the banqueting table at the end that he talks about he set up for us but so many will not come. So that you would walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. And remember all the time you didn't get here on your own. You didn't decide to one day serve the Lord or get your life cleaned up. God was working in all of that to bring you to this very place because he was calling you and I into his kingdom. Amen. Right? Amen. And I'll say... I know I've been saying a lot lately, lately, I say, Lord, I need you more and more as time goes on. But I, this morning I just sat and I was just reading through some of these things and said, Lord, I appreciate what you were doing more and more. Yes. I appreciate the salvation you gave us. I appreciate the truth. Remember we talked about Wednesday night, John bearing witness unto the truth. The truth was... This is the Christ. This is the Messiah. Now, I can understand why a lot of Jewish folks uh, don't, don't want to hear that or don't want to look at that. It's very easy to understand. And, and as we all do, we've been praying for the Jewish people from back in the 1970s. That's why we have up here on the wall to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Amen. what the Bible instructed, you know, uh, Bless them, he'll bless you. Does it mean you're going to be a financial giant? No, it means you're going to end up in the good things of life Amen. and the good Amen. things of God after this life Amen. because you bless the people of God and you obey the word. Amen. But I can fully understand why they didn't see Jesus for who he is. They were looking for someone to restore the nation. They were looking uh, for... A, a Messiah who was going to be a prince who was going to overcome all the armies and everything. And listen, you should understand that. America should understand it more and more right now because you looked for the same thing. Amen. If you say they're guilty of missing the Messiah, you and I may be guilty of taking our eyes off of the Messiah. Because we want to see a nation restored more than we want to see the kingdom of God. 
I'd say that's probably sin in God's eyes. Amen. I'd say that means we're not looking for things above anymore. We're looking for things here in the earth yeah. that the Lord told us not to. That our affections are here. I want my kids to have a better life. I want my grandkids to go, grow up and do the same things we got to do. Well, and that's not a horrible thing, but if that's what your life consists of, and you'd rather see that than the kingdom of God, then we're missing the mark. Amen. Somebody, would somebody please turn that fountain off? It echoes through here. I don't know how it sounds. We have a fountain out in our outer area there that runs water. It's the rivers of living water, and we all go out there and throw ourselves in it. That's just a joke. We don't. It's just a nice looking fountain. It puts positive ions in the air. So we did that because of some folks we have that come to church here. They need positive ions. That's what makes them smile. All right. For this cause also, verse 13, Paul says, we thank God without ceasing. Amen. What's the cause? Because. When you receive the word of God which you heard of us, that means men preaching and teaching the gospel. Remember, this was in a time when this was a totally new move that was going on. Mm -hmm. Following Jesus, Paul not really being one of the disciples that was with him. But he says, but when you heard this of us, the preaching of the gospel, the good news, you received it not as the word of men. Can all of you attest that when you heard the word, it wasn't because it was the word of men? You knew that it was God? Don't let go of that, as so many have done, to where today, well, creation may be or not be. Uh, well, living the life may be or not be. Well, did we really need a Savior? Maybe, maybe not. Don't fall into that trap of the enemy in any area of your heart or mind because that spirit is out here working in the world. Remember the Gnostic mindset we read about back in these days of these epistles is still here in the earth. If it's a spirit, it's not going anywhere till the end. It's going to continue to try to draw people into, well, I'm wiser I mean, isn't that what we say out here? We're wiser now? Well, we don't believe in that thing about the Halloween emblems and ghosts and goblins. We don't believe that anymore because we're so much wiser. Well, we can have peace in the earth nowadays because we're so much wiser. We know how to bring all the nations together and they're all going to put down what they serve and what they worship and we'll just create peace in the earth because we're so much wiser. Because we become come like gods in our own right. Only it's all in opposition to the word. Is it of God or is it of man? You receive the word not as the word of men. Wednesday night I said for some of you that weren't here, we've heard a lot of things they found since the day I came to salvation in the 1970s until now. Lots of artifacts, lots of the... Uh, Red Sea and lots of where this miracle happened and so on. They found all those things, but I believed in Jesus before I ever heard any of that. Amen. And so did so many of you. And that's what I want to continue to build in us, the faith that no matter if they come out tomorrow and say, look, we found Jesus' body and his bones. We know it's not true Amen. because this word is so alive in us. And so real to us, mm -hmm. we believe in a risen Savior, a risen Lord. Yeah. That was the opposition of everything they were looking for in that day and time. Mm -hmm. But he rose from the dead after three days, mm -hmm. ascended to the Father, paid the price for all of our sins. So when you heard the word of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Uh, somebody posted on a nice comment, said, you know, about 
being honest about things, even the hard things and the tough stuff you go through and mistakes you made. And listen, this Bible tells us about a lot of men's faults. It's not a sales pitch, because when did you ever have a salesman come to your house and tell you, listen, we'll vinyl side your house, we'll put all this, it'll look beautiful when it's done. Uh, it'll probably last a year or so. And then all of a sudden, you'll start when the sun starts beating on it, the color will fade. They told you all that in the beginning, right? Oh, no, it's going to last forever. You'll never have any nails pop or seam show. You'll never have rippling effect where they only put two nails where they should have put 12. So now it's all sagging. And they let a new guy come on the job, and he did the starter strip. So listen, we're not going to walk you around that side of the house because it's all crooked. No, they tell you how wonderful it's going to be. And they show you no fault in the product whatsoever. It's like when I was in the uh, car business with the new cars. And one day I said, gosh, this one fellow goes dealership to dealership. And every dealership he goes to, all of a sudden, those become the absolute best cars. Because he's got to keep the sales pitch up. And I said, this is all a big farce. But that's the world. That's men. But God showed us the downside of so many things, how his people failed him, how people fell into sin, how they walked away, served idols, all kinds of other stuff, what happened to them, and how he took them back. He told us the truth. Because what did it say here? But as it is in the truth, the word of God, in other words, uh, one of the men of God said, I've held nothing back from you. You fully know my doctrine. How much of the doctrine of Jesus do you remember when he talked about eat my flesh and drink my blood? People walked away from him. When he said about the Pharisees, the disciples said, Lord, don't you know you offended the Pharisees? Where did we start to believe in ministering this gospel and teaching this gospel that we weren't going to offend anybody. When our teacher, our instructor, offended, offended a lot of people by telling the truth and speaking the truth. The word is the truth. It says so right here. But as it is in truth, the word of God. The <coughs> preaching and the teaching of the gospel. Now, if I say something on my own, it could be messed up. It could be whatever. But reading this scripture and teaching interpretation and things, well, every one of us is to go look it up anyway. So if I have a wrong opinion of something, it doesn't mean I, you, you stubbornly whatever, but you ought to give heed because that opinion may be by the Spirit of the Lord and you're to discern those things, Amen. right? Amen. That's why they talked about the Bereans. Didn't just listen to his teaching, they went and checked it out in the scripture. Now, somebody who wants to be deceptive isn't going to go tell you, check it out in the scripture. Go look it up yourself. Find out what God said. Mm -hmm. huh. Go back to Jeremiah 23. Jot this down, but just go read Jeremiah 23. And see what God said when somebody comes to you as a prophet. Somebody comes to you and tells you their dream or their burden. He said, ask, what hath the Lord said? What hath the Lord answered? It's down there in 23. I don't know. It's probably, probably around verse 18 or 16 or somewhere there. You're not to believe any of that stuff. All these people coming back from the dead and all these people going to heaven and all these people prophesying all these things. He didn't say believe them. He said Ask, what hath the Lord said? In other words, we're in a situation right now. Did God say everything about the world's going to be rosy and glorious and never troublesome and never hard times? We read Wednesday night about when we come into some distress times and some times of tribulation. As I've said before, so many people who said, well, we're going to get raptured out before any of those things happen are now saying, well, gee, 
Looks like some of these things are already happening. Amen. Make sense? Mm -hmm. When you... America still has an army, right? <laughs> um, what do we do when the country's at peace? Do we still have soldiers yeah. training? Yes. Do we still do military tactical training? Do we still, you know, put them out there in the desert and go through what they would go through if they're in other places? Well, why do we do that when we're at peace? Keep people trained. Why is the church any different? Amen. Somehow we have believed because we were in peace or what looked like peace, we don't have to do a doggone thing about anything. Just enjoy the peace. No, you're to be training all the time. You're to be watching for an enemy. We got people with radars and uh, drones and everything else watching for enemies. Thing is, how many of you remember when I talked about the, the defense city and you have a watchman on the wall, he's got to be able to identify, I think that bush just moved about four feet. And gosh, most bushes are attached to the ground. So unless it's tumbleweed, it ain't really a bush, right? Amen. And so here we are today as a country. I don't know if we even know what an enemy is anymore or what they look like or how to know when they came through. I, gee, those are just a bunch of bushes coming here and going there. I, I, I don't think so. I don't know that we have tumbleweeds in Ohio. <laughs> Unless you know something different. Word of God or word of man. So listen, word of men, you can sort of decide to follow. But look what it says about the word of God. So it says, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually, effectually, worketh also in you that believe. You see, the word of God does a work in people. Amen. You see, you can't restrain people with military force in everything. Why do believers in the Lord Jesus Christ submit to law and order and authority? Because God said to, to a point. Because the word of God, which is truth, is effectually working in us. You ought to thank the Lord for the church. And a lot of folks say, well, listen, if we talk to the church, they'll never rise up against us. No, you cross God's line. Listen, when the president one day and uh, over in another country, they said there's a red line, don't cross it. Listen. Whether we respond or not, God's going to respond. Yeah. It would be good if men of God would respond and people of God would respond. Many of you need to get back involved in things like what's going on in the schools because there are red lines that are really having an effect in these kids and uh, some of the things they're pushing. That's why I keep telling you, go to that website, Protect Ohio Children. Look at what they're coming against. The, the parents are coming against in some of these areas of teaching in the schools and programs they're putting in there to where they're turning the kids against their lineage, against their parents, against family. They're making them into this thing that they don't know what sex they are, uh, all because they have this crazy thing going on in them, the spirit of confusion that's moving in those realms which effectually truth the word of god which effectually worketh also in you that believe how many of you know what that word effectually means in the greek this is going to sound kind of funny um, it's enter jail does that sound like anything enter jail Energio. Very good. Like energy, because it's doing things with vitality, with 
an activeness and a mightiness with some power, with some might. In other words, you're not apathetic. I hope I'm not a preacher known to be apathetic. I hope I'm not a parent known to be apathetic or a husband or any other thing. Because if we're apathetic, it means there's no energeo in us. There's no effectual working of the Spirit of God in us. And if you're out there listening today, wherever you are, if somebody's telling you they're filled with the Spirit, there should be an effectual working in them, an energy in them, a strength in them, because it's real. It's the truth of the Word of God. It's of God and not of men. This treasure that we have in these earthen vessels, it's not of men, it's of God to do what we're called to do in the gospel. So, how's that working? Amen. <laughs> What's it doing in you? What's it causing you to get out of because you know the time is short? What's it doing in you saying, listen, I better get my head straight. I better get my life in order. I better go back and start checking uh, all of my foundation stones. And I think there's a couple of them I need to kick out of there and replace them with those lively stones like the Bible talks about, which the fruit of the Spirit. And you can amen anytime. <laughs> And listen, always remember, it's not directed just toward you, but if it applies to you, accept it. Uh, does the, did the word of God come to us to destroy us or to give us life? What did those guys, you hear me repeat this all the time, it's like locked in me. Those guys who said to Moses, listen, we heard the voice of God because they thought they would die. And we live because when the voice of the Lord is speaking to us, it creates life in us. Amen. It exhorts us. Amen. It comforts us. And it charges us. Amen. If you're always exhorted and comforted, or just comforted, there's something wrong in the relationship. You're not hearing the fullness of what's being said. He didn't just comfort us. He didn't just build us up, you know, like a weightlifter who never does anything. I mean, you say to him, hey, you know, you got all those muscles. My car's broke down. Will you help me push my car uh, about 12 feet to get it off of the road? No, that's not why I'm like this. <laughs> you say, well, come on, dude. I'm a little skinny guy. I need some help. Sorry. What good is that if you never use it? Amen. I'm just for pictures. That's a lot of money to spend just to get your picture taken. <laughs> and that's no slam on those guys. Most of, them, most of the guys I've met at the weight room and the gym, they'll do anything to help you anywhere. Amen. I've run into some of them in some other places and had good conversations with them. Uh, anyway, so is it the word of God that you're listening to and following in a lot of things or the word of man? I'm saying all this to kind of get to a place where I want you to just listen uh, again to some warning type things. But so uh, in Acts chapter one, as uh, the letter is being written, it says, "The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up." After that, through the Holy Ghost, or after that, he, through the Holy Ghost, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, if we're really praying about the message, really praying about what we're going to hear, we're believing God that it's coming by the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's the same way Jesus gave commandments to those apostles just before he departed from them. You remember what the commandment was. We talked about it here a couple of weeks ago, the Great Commission. And also to wait for the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father in Jerusalem. Don't depart from there. That's what we were going to need 
to go about what he's called us to do, and that's going to be the power to our witness to all those around us. So when we talk about doing greater things than Jesus did, Jesus was only in that one place. It doesn't mean we're going to, you know, straighten out the heavens and the earth and things like a lot of people go to. Or like I've said so many times, even years and years ago, no, the devil's not going to get saved because you decide you're going to save him. That's not what it means. It means you're going to reach more people because you can be in other places and the Spirit of the Lord is moving in the churches and in the congregations and the people and reaching out to the lost in places Jesus never really traveled to and the disciples really didn't travel to. So he says, until the day he was taken up, do we believe the word of God or the word of man? Was he taken up? He was taken up, right? Yes. Until the day he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Let me ask you something. So sometimes in all of this and even here in the word, how come we just decide that's what he's saying? That's what the pastor at that church over there is saying. No, he read it to you right from the scripture. Amen. It's the word of God. It's not Pastor Sal's message or his word. It's the scripture. And people have left churches because pastors read scripture that they're supposed to be in love with, supposed to be living out, walking in, keeping up and teaching to other people. Then it says, in case you wondered if he really arose from the dead and was alive, it says, after, he that, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, so those 12 men were not just some guys, they were chosen by God, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, which was his death, his crucifixion, uh, his being brutally beaten at the hands of men by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days did they see him Amen. Yes. 40 days worth of seeing him and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom so even after he was crucified he rose from the dead was alive uh, many people saw him 40 days and in that 40 days, he taught again and again and again about the kingdom of God. From a man that was dead, that was now alive again. Again, would you listen? Amen. Would you say, listen, he was dead and he's alive. He told us he was the Savior and, you know, he was going to die for our sins. I guess we better listen. And again, you and I are believing that. Remember, Jesus said to Thomas, you're blessed because you've seen. You believe because you've seen. But blessed are they whom having not seen believe. And so you and I who've never seen Jesus face to face, never walked with him, never had sat under him for teaching, yet we believe on him because of what's written in the scriptures, because it's the word of God and not of man, because it is done exactly what it says here, effectually working in us. When I said a long time ago, I can't believe I'm still doing this a couple years into walking with the Lord because everything else I quit. I didn't ever follow up on anything. <coughs> My wife still thinks I don't follow up on a lot of stuff now at home. But I always get back to it. Before I left it and never went back. Today I leave it, I come back. Amen? Amen. So and sometimes like we read Wednesday night, remember Paul said Satan has hindered us? Sometimes the devil hinders us from things we should be doing, should be active in, should be known for. But listen, just like I get back to the work, get back to it. If you've strayed from what God put you to do or called you to do, I said so many times when I was younger in the Lord, I fully believed my calling was to assist the man of God, the pastor, because of what I saw happening and going on in people's lives. 
numbers didn't really matter. The fact that people's marriages got healed, people had legs grow back to normal and things fall off their faces and various things like that. I saw it was the work of God, but I had already believed before I saw any of that too. But that confirmed what I believed that the Lord said I should assist in whatever way I can. Is God calling people now to that very same thing? And that doesn't mean you still can't go out and do things. It means your life becomes active in the gospel more than just, I don't know, is it a life of God or a life of men? Well, we want to do what men say more, uh, you know, or we want to do what God says more. I guess it all comes down to this in everything we talk about. So, to whom he showed himself alive, Jesus is alive. We sing the song. After his passion by many infallible proofs. And <clears throat> seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. What was he doing? Was he reassuring them in their faith? Do you and I need reassured in our faith? Listen, we're going through some tumultuous times right now. People don't know what to do in some areas. The schools, it's up and down. I know I try to say this all the time. You may say, I'm tired of hearing it, tired of hearing it. Well, listen, when you're tired of hearing it, that's when you stop doing anything about it. Amen. That's when you stop praying about it, when you stop seeking. We're not to get tired of this kind of stuff because there's a lot of it that's still in front of us. Amen. We've got a ways to walk, it looks like. And I want to clarify in case anybody thought when I said, I'm looking for the revealing of an antichrist while I'm still looking up for the Lord to come. How many of you ever had a job on the railroad? Look at all those hands. None of you. Oh, you did? Yeah, I was a railer. Oh, okay. Well, so listen, here's the thing about if you work on the railroad without singing the song, working on the railroad, <laughs> going, oh no, that's in the coal mine. And the, no, not coal mine workers. I know you all jumped right to that. Working on a railroad, so you're a line guy, you're out there putting down track and so on, and all of a sudden you hear a whistle, right? You got a job you're doing, you're putting track down, or maybe you're just doing repairs close to the track or something, and the track's still alive, and all of a sudden you hear a whistle. You're working, but you hear the whistle, so you know when you hear the whistle, you probably should look up and see where the train is. Right? Yeah. Amen. Can you do two things at once? Yes. Yes. I know you ladies say my husband can't, but he probably can. <laughs> you say you're the multitaskers. No. So you're always listening for that because you're working near that. Does this make sense? So you're still doing the work, but if you hear that sound you know you better back up away from that track. And sometimes, depending on how fast the engine and them are coming, you know, just like behind a semi-truck, there's a wind draft that can pull you in. Amen. Okay? So you know to stay back a ways. Or you know to get your, tra your car off the tracks. Or you know to get out of your car if it's stuck on the tracks and run for your life. Because you can do what you're doing and still hear... The train a coming. And this one ain't the train of freedom. You want to get out of its way. And that's how we're to be working in the kingdom. That's how the church is to work today. We're to be working all the time, doing what the Lord's called us to do, always listening for not a whistle, but a trumpet. Knowing that we may see uh, you know, and if you happen to glimpse down the rail and you're still working and you haven't heard that train yet, you might see something that tells you, gosh, we're going to hear this sound pretty soon. What did he say about those who are looking for his coming? He's going to appear to them. You're looking for a train every time you glimpse up, glimpse, uh, <coughs> glimpse up from where you're working. You're always looking down the track just in case. That's called a wise man. 
That's what the church is supposed to be like today, not so busy about everything. And listen, if everybody's busy about, well, I have to do all this to provide my needs and so on, uh, you know, and I don't have time for the Lord and uh, be a, an example or any of those type of things. Well, Jesus, I think, said man does not live by bread alone. Amen. In other words, there are things that are more vital to our lives. Mary was at the feet of Jesus where he said, she has chosen that which is more necessary. You see, you can live with much less than what you want or what you think or where you are or want to be, but you can't make it into the kingdom with less than what God says we have to do. Amen. Does that make sense? Yeah. So are all these things of God or are they of man? Are you sitting in church today because it's of God? Or because we build a building. And people say that's a pretty building. What's our reason? Is it because of God? Then let's not lose sight of the fact that having begun in the spirit, we're not going to end up in the flesh. Amen. Suddenly cast everything aside and say, well, these fleshly things are what I really want in life then you really probably never wanted Jesus, knew Jesus, or tasted and really saw that he's good. Because once you see how good the Lord has been to us, this other stuff, you just do it because it has to be done. Amen. And it doesn't mean you don't like flowers you planted or a yard that's cleaned up or any of that stuff, but you don't live for that anymore. So, 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, there are a lot of folks debating this. There are a lot of people today that are saying, well, in fact, that's actually written in one of the epistles, and they're saying, don't read or teach the epistles. Why would you say that? These men were speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit. The same way Jesus gave command by the Holy Ghost, the inspiration of the Spirit, after he was raised from the dead for those 40 days. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Oh, wait a minute. Except the one that says, husbands, love your wives. Oh, wait, no, the one that says, wives, honor your husbands. Or that the husband is the head of the wife. Oh, forget those ones. That was just somebody that was a chauvinist. Uh, that was a woman who was back in the day who wore one of those long dresses and stayed at home and cooked. No, that's the scripture. Is it of God or is it of man? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Amen. So the man's not allowed to abuse the wife and the wife is not to uh, dishonor the husband. And then there's the thing of children and how that all goes. And then there's our dealings with one another and not taking each other to the, the courts of man and judging amongst ourselves what's right and what's wrong, as Paul talked about, which we talked about about two weeks ago. And then there's the thing of laws and not passing laws to favor one or favor the other, but do what is right in the eyes according to what the law of God is. Was the book of Leviticus, some of the writings of old, were they of God or were they of men? When God said that if a man takes another man's life, then his life should be taken. Was that of God or was it of man? When he said, thou shalt not kill, which meant murder, was that of God or was it of man? You go through all these things and everything we're talking about. Amen. So all scripture is given by the inspiration of God or the inspiration of man. People decide to change the word of God, which he said is forbidden. Don't add to, don't take away. Back there in, uh, what did I say, Jeremiah 23? It tells you in there that you pervert my words. 
Now, does that mean they rewrote them? Or does that just say maybe we gave them a different meaning nowadays? Or we said, oh, posh, posh, we don't live with that anymore. You perverted the word of the Lord. You can be a pastor, a prophet, an evangelist, a pew sitter, just a person who walks with the Lord. We can all pervert the word. Amen. If we don't listen by the spirit and listen to what the word says and read it specifically. So it's given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine is another word a lot of people don't want to hear today. We can't have unity if you're going to keep your doctrine. No, we're to be in unity in the doctrine. Amen. One faith, as it's going to bring us all to in the end, if we're in Christ Jesus, if he's truly our Lord. So it's profitable for doctrine. Hey, our church, we should take our uh, declaration of faith and throw it out the window. This is our declaration of faith. That other thing doesn't mean nothing unless it all totally lines up with what it says here. In any church that you say you're, the, you're preaching the gospel, then your declaration of faith or your mission statement should just be this Bible. Just take a picture of it, put it on the wall under where it says mission statement. Because we're supposed to do all of it. Amen. Right? We're supposed to live it all out and walk in it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine. In other words, law and order in the church and our lifestyle. And for reproof, when you step outside of what it says, we should be able to come to you and say, listen, you're not living right. You're not walking right. You're not growing like you should be. You're not changing like you should be. That's what reproof is. And that, how many of you ever told somebody, listen, you're not supposed to walk out there in the middle of the street. I remember when all this stuff was starting to happen a few years back, a group of young people walking in the street and I walked or drove up and rolled my window down. They weren't going to move over. And I rolled my window down and said, hey, excuse me, is something wrong? Well, what do you mean? And these are girls. I said, well, you're walking in the middle of the street where cars can hit you when they've got sidewalks on both sides. They laughed and kept walking, but at least they moved over. Instead of making me just sit there, let me drive by. I mean, I remember doing some pretty rude, foolish things when I was a kid. So, I mean, I understand. I'm not, a, I'm not bashing that. But more and more of that's happening where before at least you, like if the police car pulled up, at least you went, gosh, I better stop doing this. Now you do it to them too. It doesn't make a bit of difference. There's something gone awry here. So all scripture is given for uh, pro uh, profitable for doctrine. It's for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so if you're finding yourself bucking against the correction or the instruction in righteousness, well, they say you have to do this, you have to do that. Well, they say that because that's what the gospel says, what the word of God says. And 17 says that the man of God, and when we say man of God, I know it means the elders and the men of God, but it also means everybody of God, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Thoroughly furnished. What does that mean? You go to your house, you open the door, and there's no furniture, no bed, no table, no fridge, no stove. You're not really furnished for anything, right? Amen. Or you open your closet for some uh, ordeal you got to dress up for, and you open your closet, and there's, you know, there's two t-shirts and two pair of jeans in there, and this is a black tie event. You say, well, I'm not really furnished for that. My house isn't furnished to live in because we don't have any of those things necessary. 
He says that the word of God and the uh, scripture is given that the man of God may be perfect, meaning mature and on the right course, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So there shouldn't be anything you and I cannot do concerning the good works that the Lord ordains. Thoroughly furnished means well-equipped, right? Means that you've got a house filled with chairs and uh, couches and love seats and ottomans and tables and lamps and places to sit and eat with chair and table and you know, you can keep your food cold and everything else. That's well furnished. And everybody needs an extra chair. Right? To be well furnished. That means you're not to be found lacking in any of these things if you're really submitting to the word of God as it is. And if there's really preaching and teaching in all this word, which gets me... I, I hate to hear from people that say, well, you know, I go to church and they never talk about a lot of those things or these things or those kind of things and so on. So I go elsewhere to find out that kind of stuff. That really ought not to be the case. Like I say so many times, if we're called to warn people, are we just to warn them about the devil or that the devil's working in society? The devil can work in government the devil can work in church. He can work in your life. He can work in your family. He can work in your marriage. We're to warn in all these things. Thoroughly furnished means that watchman on the wall knows he's not just looking for a bush. He's looking for something that looks like a cow that all of a sudden seems like it has two heads popping out somewhere because it's two people in a costume being aware of all these things. So we know. So finally, my brethren, Ephesians 6.10. Remember, I say, try to say this every time I read this scripture. Don't tell me you're in Ephesians 6.10 unless you've already started applying Ephesians 1 through 6.9 in your life. Because that's what finally, my brethren, means. After you've applied all this, after you're walking in all this, after you're doing these things, and there's husband and wife things and family things in there, and everything, and gospel things. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. What I tell you about one of our brethren who said, I've been in the Lord this long, shouldn't I know how to stand and go through this? It's a great statement. There's a whole teaching right there in that. I shouldn't wane because all of a sudden everybody's throwing emotional things at me and trying to get me to see sympathetically through this or that or realize, you know, people have troubles. Man, I had troubles. You had troubles. We know people have troubles. We know there's chaos out here in the earth. We see the Afghanis and what they're going through along with so many other people. We get all those Voice of the Martyr reports and things. I don't know, put them on the table. I don't know if anybody looks at them or not. Are we so busy that we don't even uh, examine any of those kind of things or want to hear them? I, I don't know. I try to look through them and I get emails at home. So sometimes I don't need the actual magazine things. But for everybody else, what's occupying us? The more we're saying, look, they want to vaccinate everybody now and force you to be vaccinated. They want to take it out of your pay if you're not vaccinated. In other words, we're going to charge you for not doing what we tell you. We're going to penalize you. We're going to keep your kids out of the activities and so on, where a lot of people are just going to say, well, then well, we can't have that. Whatever's in there, I'm not worried about it. And there's more and more things coming out as we go along here. And I'm not saying, I, I again, pray for everybody that's vaccinated. Pray for everybody that's not. You know, when we get the poke in the arm, then our lives, I mean, we got to just, our lives are in God's hands. If we haven't gotten it, our lives are in God's hands. We try to remember that we're the temple of God. What does God say about what we're going to do? That's why a lot of the younger people need to be bombarded with this 
because they're throwing their bodies out there in fleshly activity. They're throwing themselves into suicidal things, thinking, like I just read a group of Christian people, and they're saying, well, it's our body, we'll do what we want, concerning going against the government. But wait a minute, it ain't your body. Amen. It's God's. The Bible says so. Both our body and our spirit belong to the Lord in Corinthians. I've got to try to do what I believe is right and best toward the Lord. Not that I say, well, I'd really like to have this or I'd feel safe. That's not the issue. God, what do you say? What do you determine? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. If he kept Israel, can he keep us? I mean, I know there's sin in the earth, and there was sin in the earth then, but he kept his people. We gotta, should we believe that first? Before I run to a doctor for a sickness or a disease, should I pray first? Should I go to the Lord first? Should I exercise faith first? Should I stand for a little while first and see what the Lord will do? Be strong in the Lord. Is the Lord of God or of man? He's of God, right? So he's not saying be strong in your own might or your own strength. He's saying be strong in me, in faith in me, in trust in me, in the knowledge of me, in my ways, and in the power of his might, the one who told us he's our avenger. He's the one who vindicates us. He's the one who's able to keep us upright. Right? The one who's able to keep us from falling. Trust in his might. Lord, I feel like I'm falling. I feel like I'm waning. I need you now. I'm entering into something sinful. Lord, I need help. I need you to get me out of this because I, I feel like I don't have any strength. Call upon the name of the Lord. He says you'll be saved. Right? Yeah. Ask and you shall receive. Yeah. Amen. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He's the creator. He's the one who created the destroyer and he's going to destroy him in the end. Trust in it. Count on it. Believe it. The power of his might put on the whole armor of God. Amen. Those soldiers out there watching over our country, uh, you know, they're out there in green khakis and green shirt and green maybe camel uh, and maybe with a beret or maybe just with their little, I forget what they call a flak hat, I think it is, uh, or flak gear. Whatever they're in, that don't scare the enemy. But when they see him with a, AR-14 or whatever they use, I forget now, or the different guns, or they see them with a rocket launcher, that scares. Because they have the weapons of their warfare. So we may look like Christians and do very well. But if we don't have any of what the Lord gave us to fight the battle with, we're not a threat to anybody. And we're not trying to be a threat to people or physically and outwardly a threat, not with real arms and real guns, but to the powers of darkness. Amen. Because that's who our battle's against, right? Yes. Or do we look on things after the outward? <coughs> are we looking at the things of man or as they are the things of God? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Paul let us know on Wednesday night in what we were reading that the devil hindered him from something. Again, the devil hinders us from lots of stuff. If we're not paying attention, we aren't to the place of perfection as yet. So there is still those areas where we fall for things. We get tricked for things. We get off course in things. We're maybe a little blinded. We got a blind spot like when you're driving your car. We didn't necessarily see the enemy creeping up on our left side because he's in that blind spot. But you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, 
Man's not our enemy in that sense. The president, the cabinet, the military guys, the police officers, whatever, they're not our enemy. He says we war not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Principalities that are unseen, that manipulate leaders and people and things and systems and manipulating system very strongly right now in a lot of ways. But listen, do you really not understand? And I, I'm not saying that you don't. I just am using this, I guess, as a phrase. No matter who's in charge of America or the EU or Israel or anywhere else, this gospel's going to come to pass. Amen. They're all going to submit to the man of sin when he's revealed. Yeah. Won't matter if it's a Republican or a Democrat or an independent party, Green Party, whatever you want to talk about. It doesn't matter. When God says release, it's going to happen. When it looks like whatever it is in that scripture that says restrains is let go, it's going to come to pass. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, so stop being mad at everybody. Should I repeat that? Yeah. Or should you just write it down? We got the secretary is going to send a letter to everybody. You'll get some church stationery in the mail. It's going to say, stop being mad at everybody. They're not the issue. The issue is the very demons and the principalities that are manipulating people that were there where Jesus talked about, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Don't leave, leave your helmet of salvation off. You can't battle the devil by saying, I'm nice. No, that doesn't scare him. It's the weapons of warfare that the Lord has given us. Is this of God or is it of man? Is it something they just put in here to make us feel good? So you could maybe get, like, like it said that the, originally, I guess, they considered the men of God as warriors for the kingdom of God, so they granted them tax exemption uh, like they did the military guys or something uh, because we're in the battle. Well, some point in time, don't be shocked if they take all that away. Use what you can use for now. If they take your citizenship away, well, I'm still a citizen of the kingdom of God. And they may do those things. We don't know what men are going to do to accomplish what they're going to accomplish in these days. Look how surprised you are at what's gone on in the last year and a half. But our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ because he doesn't leave us hopeless. He doesn't leave us without escape. And when we say he's our avenger, whatever evil's being done to us in the end, he's going to avenge it all. It's going to be a sad day. But it's going to happen. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities. Your sister-in-law is not the problem. <laughs> you all must have a problem with the sister-in-law. Why you all jump to that, I don't know. I don't know why I said it. I got good sister-in-laws. All of them are saved, Amen. believers. <clears throat> I think. <laughs> uh, wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Listen, it ain't the people that hurt your feelings. It's the principalities and powers that work through those words or through that look. <laughs> or who dialed the phone and left it on. <laughs> Are you scared yet? <laughs> <laughs> the principality of fear, demon of fear, they're just doing what they're doing. Hey, I just want you to know I love you, even though you're trying to scare me. How's that make you feel? 
principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Is there still darkness in the world? Oh my the darkness of this world. Take the church out of the picture. Darkness. Take Christ out of here. You want Christ out of the schools and the gospel out of the schools. I just read where somebody's posting here locally about getting it out of our government. Watch and see what happens when you get it out. Amen. You'll see corruption like you've never seen. Amen. You'll see oppression like you've never seen. Because this gospel, the effectual working of the gospel in them that believe is affecting everything that's going on today. Amen. Keeping it from sinking into total darkness. But one day, what did we read a little bit ago? The day will come, or the time will come. Pay attention. Yeah. You say you love the Lord, and listen. The Bible tells us there in Corinthians, I think it is, where it says about having no fellowship with those that are fornicators and idolaters and so on, adulterers, and he says about have no fellowship with them, and yet so many of us are still fellowshipping with just about everybody. We don't want to separate from nothing and nobody. He said, come out from among them and be ye separate. And you're saying, well, I'm a believer. I'm okay here. Well, there's a reason he told the believers to come out from there. There is a reason. Are you asking God, what should I do differently? How should I handle this? And some of them are the people we love the most. But we know they don't want to hear the gospel. We know they aren't going to listen to what we're saying. And they're always bathing us in what they do. And we're not even allowed to mention the gospel. Or reprove, what did we say? The doctrine, reprove or correct, instruct in righteousness. We're not allowed to do any of that around them. You need to ask the Lord what you should do at this point in time because you may be jeopardizing your own place so he says there's sp a spiritual wickedness in high places against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places now some people are telling everybody today that well the devil doesn't have any power you know the devil doesn't that won't happen we're all in this together, which the motto of, is that of man or God? I guess, I don't really know. We're all in this together. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, he told me to come out and be separate. Amen. He said, I put a difference between you and them. What's he mean by that? Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Well, wait a minute. I thought we weren't going to be here in the evil day. What is this? Withstand in the evil day. We're not supposed to go through anything. We're not supposed to have any tribulation. Somebody's preaching a false message. Amen. Because Jesus said in the world, you will have tribulation Amen. as long as we're here Amen. until that great trumpet sounds and he calls us out. Yeah. Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And as we're called, or at least I believe I'm called, to warn and watch and persist and keep it up, there's an evil day coming. Amen. And I want you to be able to stand. Yes. I want my sons and daughters and family to be able to stand. Amen. I don't want them to be tricked by things to where, uh, and listen, so many people, and this is like a big question now on the internet, is the vaccine the mark of the beast? Well, of course not. But like I said, I believe Wednesday night, you can see how they've created a fear and a patriotism 
and a you better or you won't to where people don't even check out what's there. Okay. And I'm just saying, if you did and you kind of didn't really check things or sort of feel like you got dragged into that that way, listen, the Lord will take care of you. Like I said, this is not the mark of the beast. But realize that it's going to be stronger. Amen. Remember he said about delusion, and he's going to send strong delusion. So gird up the loins of your mind. Get yourself that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. The evil day may be when the mark comes. And the man of sin is there. And the world is saying you have to, you have to, you have to. And you're going to have to decide, is this of man or is this of God? Because God doesn't make it that way. That you may be able to stand in the what day, in the in the evil day and having done all which means listen here I am today and look this stuff is all looking like it's happening and I'm going to the Lord saying Lord I've tried to keep myself in your ways I've tried to flee from lustful things I've tried to cast off those things that beset me I've, I've tried to renounce the hidden things I try to get my heart clean I, I've said uh, do a work in me, cleanse me, wash me, you know, forgive me. I've, I've sought you, I've called, I've ministered, I've stood, I've battled against all these things. I don't want to let down now. Having done all, I've tried to use the sword of the Spirit. I've tried to keep on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate. I've tried to walk in the righteousness that you gave me in Christ Jesus. I've tried to hold to the truth with that truth as the belt around me and the gospel of peace that I've tried to promote peace in the midst of all kinds of things. Not peace keeper, but a peacemaker. This is how you have peace. This is how peace will come to Jerusalem. The Messiah finally comes and sets up his kingdom. I've tried to keep all these things so that I can stand in the last day. You may be able to withstand the day of evil, having done all to stand. I've tried to gird up the loins of my mind. I can't let this affect me to where I die on the vine. I can't let apathy affect me to where I'm useless toward anybody. Here I sit with my gun and my helmet on and my boots and my camo and bullets all around my belt. And I, I just can't lift up my hands to do anything anymore. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all, to stand. Here I am, Lord. I don't have much left, but I'm still standing. I've lost some weight. I've lost what I thought was worth holding on to in the areas of pride or possessions and everything else. I'm almost standing here just with the very clothes I have on my back, but Jesus is still my Lord. I'm still holding to the truth. I'm going to testify like John was a witness unto the truth. I'm going to be a witness that no matter what, he's still Lord of all. Yes. Having your loins girt about with truth. In truth. The word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. If you're letting the truth work in you. Gird about with the truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. Because the effectual working of this gospel is always cleaning us up. Perfecting us making us ready for that day. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. He said to live peaceably with all men as much as is possible. Amen. But you know what he didn't say? Live in fear of all men and keep your mouth shut about the gospel. And I know there are people that are living that life right now. 
because they know if I say anything to them, they're going to be offended and they're not going to come around or I'm not going to be able to see them and so on. That's fear. Remember when we talked about witchcraft? We talked about fear, dominating, manipulating, overpowering. That's all witchcraft. That's why, listen, I've watched people in the ministry do that very same thing and break people to where all of a sudden you saw them almost anything that person says, okay, okay. No, it ain't supposed to be that way. You and I are to be mature and make decisions based on the truth of the gospel, not what somebody said and we're kowtowing to them. Right? That's why you heard me say so many times, hey, I don't ask you to do anything other than what the gospel says. If there's things in the church, yes, I would expect people would rush to do some things in ministry and assisting. And remember that ministry to the saints, the one addiction it tells you in the Bible you're to have, right? Amen. Addicting yourselves to the ministry of the saints means that you're available to do the works of God in things. And sometimes that means in the midst of what we need to do. We have events we do and ministry things. We do outreach for other people. There should be an availing to all of that stuff as much as is possible because it's ministry to the saints. It's furthering the gospel. It's promoting the word of God. Amen? Amen. So have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I ran into somebody the other day and I know my last encounter wasn't good, so I entreated him. I was going to be the peacemaker. Oh, really? I, I hardly remember that. Because they brought it up in front of a bunch of people. Oh, well, that's okay. It really doesn't bother me anyway, because I forgave Lord. They don't know what they're saying. I mean, that's how you got to live life. Otherwise, you're going to be hurt by everything. Somebody told me the Italians lost a, lost a football game. I was offended for a minute, but then I said, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Above all, taking the shield of faith. What did we talk about? I think Wednesday night or last Sunday. Faith stands. Amen. Take the shield of faith. wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. When the lady said to me in the midst of a conversation, well, you remember what happened with Jim Jones, right? Jim Jones, I said, he was a cult. That was cult mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> no, I don't know what you mean or what you're trying to imply. But when you're preaching to people, go look in the scriptures yourself. Amen. When you're telling them to follow Jesus, and if I'm not following him, don't follow me, like Paul said. Amen. And you're telling them, don't come to me for all of your answers and questions. Go to God. Amen. That's the preaching of the gospel. That's the truth of the word. And yes, you do need to be born again. That's not cultish. That's the gospel that Jesus taught and preached. Amen. Born again. John 3.3. 3, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have eternal life. 17 says God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that through him the world might be saved. That's Jesus speaking. Jesus talking to Nicodemus, the religious leader who should know these things he said. There's no cult practice in that. That's how men get into the kingdom of heaven. But what would the devil do? Just like he's tried to pervert the fact that the Messiah would come through a virgin. So all these false God things before that it was all a mother and a child and a mystical birth 
and some crazy thing that all turned into idolatry and worship, preluding the coming of the Messiah. I guess that's maybe why I think the man of sin would come, the imposter, in place of the Messiah, would be coming before the true Messiah. Because after the church is gone, we don't stand any risk of being deceived by any of that stuff. Does that make sense? Yes. Just like when I talked about the Eastern Gate, if you see some guy and all of a sudden they open the Eastern Gate, tear down all the walls and barriers like they started to do from the backside, letting the Muslims in there to pray, pay attention. If the, if the wall's being torn down, remember I think I even said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And they say, Mr. Hail High Muckety of the religious tear down that wall, get ready for somebody to come walking through that gate. And if he walks through on physical legs, it ain't Jesus. Amen. It ain't the Messiah. Because he's coming in the clouds, the Bible says. Amen. And he's going to start on the Mount of Olives. And there's going to be a split. Nobody's going to have to open the gate. Nothing's going to prevent him. That's the Messiah. Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, which or wherewith you may be able, you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. Everything that gets shot at you. Eh, pff, knock that one away. Oh, that's a little one. Boom. I better throw it away, knock it away too. You don't let little ones hit you. Ah, oh, that's just a kid saying that nasty thing to me. Then down the road, you wake up one morning, that nasty thing is right there because you didn't quench the fiery dart. You thought it's just a little dart, like throwing darts. How many of you, you know somebody when you used to play darts as kids and everybody tries to be funny, so somebody runs in front of the dartboard. <laughs> and all of a sudden, oh! Well, it's just a little dart. Man, it sure hurts. Better wash it out so it doesn't get infected. Well, no, it's not an arrow that can go halfway through you, but it still hurt, still drew blood, still made you cry. <clears throat> oh, that reminds me, you told that story. That's <laughs> somebody we know that was doing that and had that happen. But if you watch some of the funny things on some of the TV things, they've got them too, like America's funniest videos or some of that stuff. Anyway, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. You know, as I was reading this in the last couple of days, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, <clears throat> which is the word of God. I don't know if that all goes together. I know we've always said the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Uh, but anyway, it says the helmet of salvation. We've got to know we're born again, according to the scripture. We got to know that we didn't put down our helmets somewhere along the line and go live life out here in the world. And now we're running back to the Lord, but we don't have the helmet of salvation. It means we need to get saved. In case you didn't get that. Amen. And the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication. Amen. In the spirit. So praying always in verse 18 and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Pray and watch again, just like Jesus said, watch and pray that you be not tempted. Praying also with all prayer and or always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Okay, let me stop right there. You don't have to, I, I don't know if folks would be able to see this or not. Maybe we should end with that. This morning, listen, if you've listened in, the Bible says if you just put your trust in Jesus, turn your life over to him and walk with him, ask him to forgive you of your sin, the Bible says you can be saved. 
and God will begin to work in your life just as he's worked in all of ours here because we weren't always following Jesus. We weren't always trying to do good. We were evil and wicked, living life, or maybe we didn't do any of that stuff and maybe you haven't been uh, wicked or evil in a lot of things yourself. You've tried to do good, you've tried to do right, you may even be religious. But the Bible still says that it's concluded that all are under sin, every one of us. And so we need a savior. His name is Jesus. He came and died and paid the price for all of our sins when he died on the cross and shed his blood. And that through him we can be saved. If you'll believe on the work and trust in the work of what he did at the cross, he said he'll forgive you of all your sins. Just ask him to come into your life. Let him be your Lord and Savior. Lord means you're going to live according to what he says in the scriptures in the Bible. But he helps you with all that. He empowers you to do it like he did for all of us. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to come into your life. Ask him to keep you till the kingdom of God comes and you want a place in the kingdom and you'll find that the Lord will meet you there. If we can help you, send a message, send questions, whatever you like, we'll try to help you any way we can. But get in a good Bible preaching church and follow the Lord and you'll be blessed. Amen. God bless. Amen.